Right, well, thank you for sticking it out. Um, so this is the talk, Java in the 21st century. Uh, again, Sugori, so how many people here are Java programmers? Oh, thank gosh. I did a talk this morning about cybersecurity, and I said, how many people are Java programmers? And I didn't get very many. So you guys should have been at my other talk. OK. Um, so 50 minutes on Java in the future. Um, I work for IBM. I'm a developer advocate which means I have the fun to go out and talking to you guys about great stuff that I do back at the lab. I come from the UK. I work in a research and development lab where we do all sorts of stuff, including JVMs, right? And I've been in JVMs for a long time since, as I say before, it was one. Um, but I've done the stuff as well. That's one of the big, best things of working in a development lab is you get to play with all sorts of stuff. And now I get to come and talk to you about it. So this talk is about where Java's going. Well, one possible vision from an IBM point of view. It's not the only opportunity, but it will help you understand some of the stuff that's coming. And hopefully, you'll learn about the ways that you have to be changing to sort. So as I said, most of this is going to be more about what you've got to do rather than what's happening to JVM. The JVM changes are coming because of pressures from all sorts of places. But at the end of the day, they're pressures that everybody understands. It's the consequences to us as developers, right? And there's some ghost stories, as I said, because it's Christmas, and there may be a happy ending, right? So before I can do the future, I have to do a little bit of the past, just to set the scene, right? So what happened 22 years ago? Something wonderful. Any ideas? God, 22. You were born. No, don't say that. Gosh. Right. 22 years ago, Java came out and we went, it's brilliant. For a whole bunch of really good reasons, we fell in love with Java. And we made it the number one programming language and platform. Bear the platform word in mind as we carry on through this talk. Because of the way that we created it, we got an enormous set of opportunities. Right? Everybody piled into Java because of all the things it could do that we couldn't do previously. Cross-platform, you know, that was just fantastic. Just nowadays, people don't even realize just how hard it is or how hard it was to move code from platform to platform. Nowadays, we just take it as granted, right? And so really, up until quite recently, we went, hey, we've done it all. Java is the answer to everything. Nothing else matters. You can write code. You can run it anywhere. It can do anything. Well, things are changing. So the present, right? It's a Christmas story, you know? So past, present, future. Right? So Java's sort of lost some of its shine. Nice coffee cup. We love the coffee. We're going, well, there's a bit of a bitter taste in a few places. We don't like it. And when you start talking to people about what they don't like, right? mostly they're not Java programmers. They're all the people who didn't choose Java for various reasons. And they have all sorts of things. Don't worry about reading them. right? You know what these complaints are. Lots of them. It's slow. It's old. It's your father's thing. It's COBOL. You know, it doesn't work, it doesn't do what I want, it doesn't change fast enough, I want it to be faster. Why doesn't Java do this? We have all those things, right? And to be fair, a lot of the complaints, a lot, a few specific complaints are true, right? It's taken, us, taken the Java community a long time to deliver stuff. It took us five years to get project to get lambdas out. Five years to deliver on something that we were talking about before that as being really important for the for Java. And then really recently we got Java nine with modularity. It took us ten years. I don't know if you ever saw Mark Reinhold stand up and he and he said twenty five you know, Java's twenty five 20 years old and modularity is 10 years old. We were talking about modularity in Java for 10 years ago, and even at that point, we already have modularity. We had a good understanding of what we were trying to do. It took us a long time. 
right? The thing is, though, this none of this stuff is easy, right? So a lot of the problem that Java has about its capability has comes from the fact that we have a perception problem. Now we have a delivery problem, but we have a perception problem, and they're interlinked, right? The amount of effort necessary to create lambdas in a JDK or put modularity in is huge. Enormous amount of man hours, not just from the Oracle on the Open JDK team, from everybody got involved, right? But for some reason, because it just came out in one go, hey, here's lambdas, here's modularity, and because it took so long, people said Java's old, it's not evolving fast enough. And that again is sort of true, but it was mostly the fact that we spent a long time between new ideas emerging. So we're fixing that. You will have seen recently a whole bunch of things that are happening during this space. So Oracle's donation of e Java EE to Eclipse. And I don't know if you were seeing, but they're calling out for people to participate and say what the name of the new thing should be. Right? Uh, IBM, IBM open sourced its application server. Uh, that's called Liberty. There's an open Liberty project. We gave it away. We open sourced it. Um, as a community, we created a thing called microprofile.io. Right? Another sign of evolution. Uh, when IBM also contributed or finalized contributing of all our J9 VM code. So if you want another VM that's battle hardened, that's got the same credentials as Hotspot, there's one in Eclipse now, right? And the other thing is the new release of Java, the new release cadence. So now we're going on a feature train. Mark Reinhold and others across the board, we've all said, how do we get stuff out quicker? And the answer is, let's have a release process where you can have a train that leaves the station every six months and the, ne the latest features deliver on it. Easy to say, hard to make happen. But that's what we're doing. So the question you have to ask yourself when you're looking at this, you're going, is that enough? Have we done enough to get out of the problems that we had before? When you look at why we're doing these things, so again, so why is Oracle donating our Java EE? So some quotes from David here, but I called out in red some of the, the important bits. Adopt more agile processes, implement more flexible licensing, change the governance process, remove the roadblocks, right? Make the process of evolving these standards more agile. We recognize we need to change those things. Microprofile.io, this was what we created faster pace than standards. We recognize that the standards that we've created have got in the way, right? And multiple implementations, again, something else that's really important for us is not just to have one code base, to have multiple code bases to choose from. Same with Liberty, same thing, accelerating Java. How do we get stuff out there so that people can participate? If we don't open source it, we can't make it go faster. If we don't open source it, we can't get enough people together to move it forward fast enough. This stuff takes time and effort, right? How do we get Java into the cloud? What's the next thing that it's gonna look like? Well, where do we have that conversation? Behind closed doors or out in open source? Where do we trial things out? Where do we do in Java what other programming languages do? Where do they trial things? Where do we try it in open source? And that's what we're trying to do. And the same with OpenJ9. We have the same thing. So OpenJ9, as I said, is IBM's JVM. The thing that you can go get from OpenJ9, you can download from Adopt, Open, um, Adopt Open JDK, is the thing that's in production. They're not separate pieces. They are the same code base. There's a whole bunch of innovation that's happened in OpenJ9 over the years that some of the ideas have ended up in a hot spot. We have other ideas, some of which I'll talk about. Um, but the point was, if we don't get this stuff out there, we can't get the pace of innovation up. So the question again is, is this enough? Do we need to move faster? We've got new code bases for innovation. We have new communities building. We're creating multiple choices. Is it enough? Okay. 
Well, so let's be pragmatic about it. What is it that we have want Java to do for the future? Right? So there are three areas, and there are you know, other areas, but three that we could probably pick out. So cloud, obviously, data analytics, uh, which is the cloud with the cogs in for some reason, and machine learning, which is the brain. Okay. They're the three areas that if we were going to put any evolution and investment in, it would be top of the list. And of course, because this is competing with other programming languages, which have already stolen, stolen a march on Java, the question is, well, we've got it better than them in some places. Not the same, but selectively better. And I picked a few. So it's easy to stand up and talk about programming languages and go, mine's better than yours, and we know what sort of fistfights you get out of that. So I thought, rather than do that, we'll actually do something real. We're going to have some races. Let's have a few races. So I'm going to show you the results of some benchmarks. I'm going to do it live, live-ish. Right? So here's the first one. Uh, this is one designed to measure number crunching on a single CPU, single thread, basically. Right, do some modeling of predictions of where the Java planets are going to be, do that n number of times, how quickly you do it is the winner. Okay. So let's line them up. Who thinks, not that I can see that much, who thinks that Java is going to be the best at number crunching? Ooh, okay. Who thinks that maybe maybe it's Python? Okay. No is oh well, well, look at this. Some willing volunteers to okay, so let's see what happens. This is pretty much real time, because these benchmarks take a few seconds to run. So who's going to finish first? Well, neck and neck, and OK, 10 seconds, 15, oh, come on, 20 seconds, somebody's going to finish. Oh, look, hey, go, Java, neck and neck, and, 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 oh, node's finished. OK, who thinks that... Um, Ruby and Python finished there. Okay, good. Here's the data. Go, 21 seconds. Swift, 21 seconds. Java, 20 seconds. Ruby and Python, minutes. Ooh, okay. And here's the related, some related stats. So I took off the Python and Ruby um, piles, big, um, bars because they'd be too high. Um, you can see there's not much going on. CPU seconds, that's the same as the as the um, elapsed time, basically. And, well, Java uses loads of memory, and so does Node. Swift is pretty good, and Go is amazingly tight on memory for this benchmark. Let's do another one. Let's do Mandelbrot. So this is fractal calculations. It's more numbers, big grid, 1,600 by 1,600. When you're finished, stick it out as a uh, byte bitmap. So this is multi-processing, big number crunching. OK. Now, I could ask you, but I'm not going to. Let's see what happens when we run it. So, wow. Swift is finished. Go's finished. Java's finished. OK. Who thinks No's going to finish next? Uh, uh, yes. There we go. Let's, let's not even wait. OK, and if you look at the data, yet again, Swift, Go, Java. Well, Swift is really fast, right? And then Python and Ruby, well, it's not, it's still minutes, but it's not stupid amounts of minutes. And if again, if you look at the CPU time, again, pretty low. Memory, no, loads of memory to do that. Swift, so Java, OK, right? Different patterns are starting to emerge here. And if you start looking then at, um, how they use the multiprocessor. So this is all running, these are all running on quad cores. So every one of these lines represents the, how much a particular CPU core was being used. And you can see Java, almost all of it, pretty flat lines, Swift, et cetera, all the same. And Node, not as good as, it, as the others, okay? Let's do some more. Binary tree. This is a GC benchmark. I'm gonna take a binary tree and I'm going to mutate it over time for a set number of things, and then I'm going to measure how long it takes to do that. Right? And this is a measure of garbage collection because there's enormous amounts of churn. How quickly can you reclaim memory? 
If you get the benchmark wrong, you run out of memory. Okay. So again, we're going to start. So, who's going to finish this time? Wow, so we're finished. Five seconds. Java, oh, Java's pretty good. And Go, which was pretty good at doing number crunching, is going, going. Okay, keep going. And yeah, let's give up. None of them finished, as far as this thing is concerned. Swift, five seconds. Go, 35 seconds. Ruby and Python, not, well, not almost a minute and just over a minute. Different pattern, garbage collection, memory management. Right? And again, you look at the statistics, CPUs wibbling around. Memory, Java used loads of memory, finished fast, because Java has a really good garbage collector. Uh, node, loads of memory. We know I'm there. Right? And again, what happens in the CPU side? Java, not as good as I'd like to have seen in terms of accessing, getting throughput on all the G on all the, 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 the cores. Right? But Node, not very good at all. And Swift, disappointing. And all these performance benchmarks, they're very small benchmarks, and they're trying out little tiny things to give you an idea of how the programming language should behave, what their design points are, and how it comes out. Right, so the last one here, um, regular expressions. So this is how quickly can you parse a bunch of data with some set regular expressions. So micro benchmarks, do it fast. So here we go. So who's gonna be the winner this time? Well, you'll be surprised. Ooh, node finished, like that. And then Java, and so on. We finished that. That might have been a surprise. Node didn't do too well in all the others, but in this particular benchmark, it did really well. And there was a good reason for it. And here's the numbers. Node, four seconds. So you could argue that if you're doing loads of regular expressions, go use Node. Um, but if you're, but Java's not too bad. You know, and Swift, which was really good before, and Go, that was really good before, didn't do so well. Right. And if you try and figure out what's going on, again, you can see Java still uses loads of memory, but that's not really an indicator because Java is actually designed that way. Swift, hardly any memory, Node, loads of memory, even though it finished fast. Right. And then in the CPU side, again, it's a bit strange. Java maximizes its use of CPUs. Swift, not so good. Node, worse. But that's Node's design point. Right? So what you begin to see in out of all of this is some trends. Right? So if you take them in the isolation, then you've got to be very careful. So there's a story, a very old story, about a bunch of blind men who introduced an elephant for the first time. And they're all positioned around the elephant, and they touch the elephant. And they get a different impression of what the elephant is. Some think it looks like a snake. Some people think it looks like a wall. They get a different impression, because they were just looking at one thing. Right? And that's what benchmarks are like. So we have to be careful. In this case, our benchmarks come from this, uh, the computer language benchmarks game, uh, which I thoroughly recommend go have a look. You can see 100 lines benchmarks. You can see how people write code, and you can contribute. But it gives you trends, though actually the trend it says in all that we've seen so far is don't use Node, apart from regular expressions, which is unfair. Um, this is a uh, screenshot of uh, an open source tool that my team produced called AppMetrics, uh, and it measures response times to HTTP requests. And we put together something really simple, so you can see uh, there's a Node stack and a Swift stack and a Java stack. The things to look at, just in this example, are the scale of the top line. So the node scale, um, you can see it just pops around just over somewhere between 0 and 2 milliseconds. Well, the Java one is 0 to 20 milliseconds, right? We all know what node's good for, right? And some of the benchmarks I've shown you doesn't show in its good light, right? 
So as I said, this stuff gives us trends. What are we getting out of this? Right? And we can see that Node is winning the Cloud I space, do non-blocking I.O., don't do CPU uh, because it's not what it's designed for, goes great, but you have to put a lot of effort into it, and actually it's more like C, so we might see Go in the JVM. And then things like Python, which we see so much in data, in, uh, in data analytics and machine learning, as a programming language, at least the benchmarks we saw, isn't very good performance-wise. So other things are going on there, including a whole bunch of native libraries that it's connected to. Very fast native connectivity, right? So you could argue that when you take the world today and you divide it up and you go, here's what I want to do, data analytics and cloud and machine learning and stuff like that, that there are programming languages best designed to do that. So you could ask yourself, what does that leave Java in this space, right? So I want to talk a little bit about the in innards because this is where it's important for what I'm going to talk about next, which is more about the future. So the interesting thing is underneath all of these programming languages, these courses, they're all written in C. So the performance differences you get are to do with how we write the code, how it was designed, right? And there are three different types of things, right? Runtime languages, scripting languages, modern native languages, and they give you different characteristics. So Java is type safe. Type safe is the one of the biggest benefits. It means JIT can do really cool stuff, optimize across the across the board. JavaScript, you don't know whether a thing, in, an int is an int, until the very last moment. So optimization in JavaScript is really hard, but you don't have a compile process, and you can be you can write more flexible code, right? In Java, we can optimize your whole class library or even your whole application because of the type safety. And then we've got things like um, re-optimization. If you have a JIT, if we know what your Java code is doing, we're measuring it, as you change the workload, we can re-optimize, right? That's a really big, important thing that you can do with Java. And we have one of the best garbage collectors, probably the best garbage collector of any runtime. We pay for it by having more memory, but actually we get massive throughput because of it, right? Uh, the um, Swift uses reference counting, right? And reference counting can be faster under certain circumstances, but it's not uh, totally, totally the best idea. Reference counting means that when you, you pass an object around, the inc uh, you increment a, uh, a number in the object, and when you when you've lost when you basically destroy it, the number gets destroyed, the number gets reduced. When it gets to zero, you garbage collect. And that means garbage collection happens in line to wherever your code is that we're at the point where you say, I don't want this object anymore. With GC running the background is able to ensure that your application doesn't get affected by these peculiar um, um, situations. And then single threaded, which is what JavaScript does, uh, means you don't have to do any locking or any synchronization, which is great, right? But it means any time that you any time that you do something that isn't I.O. bound, you lock up the system, right? And the other thing to think about is where you can get these programming languages and how they get there. So how does Java get onto a new platform? What's the porting process? Well, it's easier to do that than it is to do something in JavaScript. Because we have an app, because we have a JVM, so we have an architected layer, and we can take a JVM and we can move it somewhere else, and your classes will continue to work. Now with JavaScript, you can take JavaScript and move it around, but somebody has to take the JavaScript engine and take your JavaScript and turn it into machine code. They have to write all that, all that transformation, right? And that's heavyweight. And so all of these things for Java are what we believe means we can go further with Java than we can with any programming language, right? All of that stuff, unique to Java, gives us a much better insight in what your application is doing, means we can re-optimize, means we can move it around. We can get your Java to go places that you weren't expecting it to go. Right? And nowadays, if you're looking at it, like we're doing with uh, the OpenJDK, like reducing the ceremony to make it easier to write less Java code, 
looking at where, how do we improve our native interop so we can take on Python, so we can talk to native libraries faster and more efficiently. What are we doing to reduce memory footprint? A lot, because that's a cloud requirement, right? Faster startup, cloud requirements. We can put those into the VM. Your code doesn't change. We can implement it. We can make sure that how it gets implemented on the hardware is different. Startup time for Java is based on the JVM being tuned a certain way to deal with the workloads that we used to want to run on Java, which were long running stuff. When you want short running um, workloads, you want a different optimization. So we put that in the VM. Basically, the JVM is our superpower. You're supposed to go, yay, okay, right. Yay, okay. So that's the background, right? So much as people go, Java is, oh, well, Java's old, right? And as a Java programmer, I might go, well, yeah, some of it's a bit old, but we're getting better. The fact is, the VM and the characters of the VM are just fantastic. And so when we go into the future, we look at what's coming, you, this is, we are going to see why it is that we think the JVM is the place that we're going to put this innovation because of all those characteristics, right? And the funny thing is, is we're not doing this stuff because we can. We're doing it because we need to. But the biggest change for all of us in the future is not Java code, right? It's what you're going to be doing. It's your changes, changes to you as a developer. So as a current developer, what do you do? Well, one way or the other, you manipulate data. You create it, you analyze it, right? We all know what Java programmers do, right? And you have economic constraints, you know, I need to do this within a certain time scale, my boss needs it done next week. How's that gonna change? Well, all of that isn't gonna change, but what you do is gonna change, right? Because things are changing so fast, right? I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. There are so many new technologies, and there are no, so many new things like cybercrime. So it's on the list there because it's an amazing, phenomenal threat to us. We have to do things differently, right? But this is just a brain dump. You could add other things to the list. They are all in conflict. All this stuff is coming together to say, we need to be making use of this. What does it mean to you as a Java developer? What is it that you've got to do differently? And the simple answer is, you have to think differently, and you have to think so much more about data than programming. So much of your life is gonna change to be focusing on the manipulation of data in different ways to get the effect, rather than the old style um, writing code. Right. And it's a massive opportunity. But the people who get their heads around this, the people who go off and learn about machine learning and data analytics and do it the right way and understand then you're going to make loads of money. So are you worried? Cloud? Well, cloud isn't really a big problem. Cloud is very much similar to what we know before. Yes, there are new technologies involved, but it's still write app server, stick it in the cloud, right? Worry about those economics, right? Maybe you worry about what you're going to do with modularity and J2EE and things like that, but that's just like now. We know really where that's going to go. The big change is the new requirements. So I don't know if you can see this, but here's a bunch of them. You can imagine that lots and lots of people, when you work for a company like I do, there's lots of input from people who want things. I'm always looking at leading edge. But so many of these sorts of things, tailor responses to the personalities of your customers, how many of you know how to do that? Knowing the latest, most significant developments in your profession or industry the moment they take place, what would you do? So much of the future for us is learning things that we've never learned before. Products and services that improve themselves over time. What does that mean? But it's happening, right? Machine learning, data analytics, AI, all coming together with a whole bunch of other services to do things that you weren't expecting. And you don't write Java code the way you used to. You're going to be making use of services, and you're going to be learning things that are black boxes and applying them. Right? Processes that identify their own inefficiencies and address them. Some sort of positive feedback process. 
what does that mean? Right? Uncovering patterns, etc. That all of these things, when you look at this and you go, I don't know what that means. I can read the words, but how does that translate to me as a developer? Right? And that's the biggest challenge for us. Right, and for you is learning that you've got to move into the world of APIs and you've got to learn to move black boxes and you've now got to go learn things that you never learned before. You've got to go learn about neural nets, you know, um, data analytics, etc. Right. So it's about us thinking differently. So I've got some examples now to try and help you think about thinking differently. Uh, and it's a sort of a concrete problem, and we're just going to morph the problem so you can see. And I'll introduce some of the technologies that we can see coming. So, a word grid. We all know what word grids are. Here's a list of words, and they are applied in this grid in multiple different directions, eight different directions. Okay, One of those words is not in that grid. So how would you go solve that problem? Well... You might write some pseudocode like this, which is basically get every string in the list and then go through every single letter in a, in a search pattern and see if you can find that. Right. And when you're finished, because you, you could write some procedural code like that, for x equals naught to whatever and for y equals naught to whatever, visit each point, do some nice calculations, record the word. And if you're really finished, what you end up with is you've identified which word is missing and you know where all the others are. And you've probably ended up written code that looks something like this. Yes, we've all been there because that's what we do. We write code. And it's so much easier to write code and make lots of code than it is to think differently about it. And of course, that example turns out to be pretty slow because it's single-threaded. So if I was trying to do this at scale, that would not be a good algorithm. Now, I have some stuff to hand. I have int streams. Int streams are great because I get parallelism for free. I've just got to construct my algorithm slightly differently. So in this example, top line, I create an int stream that gives me the numbers naught to however big the grid is in terms of you know, x, by, x by y. It gives me a number, naught to n. And then for each of those numbers, I can do some little arithmetic, and I can get by my x, y, and I can do all that horrible code. And now I've got some parallelism, da -da, so it finishes a lot quicker, which is great. That was easy. But I still have a bunch of yucky code. Right? I have to figure out about string lengths and things. So um, when you're looking through this grid, you've got to deal with, oh, I guess the red line's moved. But if you look, say, looking for J in Java, there it is in the middle there, below the circle, um, and there's one up there in the top right. Each of those is candidates, but because you could walk off the end of the grid, you have to do some calculations, which makes your code just more complicated. You don't have to do that. You can change your data. You can put a border of empty cells around your data. That's the width of the longest uh, string that you're looking for. And then you'll never run off. You'll never have um, an exception where you fell off the end of the grid. Right? And that you get by just changing the data structures. And that's one of the things that you'll be doing a lot more of. And you can do more. So those positions, x, y, z, which direction do I go, they're just offsets. So I can recalculate the code and say, rather than have code, I can have a little matrix that says, for any position, to get to the next one in each direction, I apply an X or a Y offset. There's an array of those things. Right? And I can put that stuff together. And now I have less code. And it's data-driven. I'm not having to write lots of if conditions. And that's really important, and you'll see why later. Okay, okay. So they're great when you've got small numbers of data, but what happens when you've got a large amount of data, like an infinite grid, billions of characters, millions of words to find, words that are so long, supercalifragilistic thingy, you know, that's a big buffer on the outside, right? What do you do? Well, you start going out to clusters. You start using things like Apache Stark and Hadoop. And if you haven't used those already, they'll be coming to you at any point. 
And as soon as you do that, you have to start thinking differently because now you've got to start thinking again about how you manipulate data. So you could obviously take the big grid and break it into pieces and go noding node one, do this bit, node two, do this bit, node three, do this bit. But then suddenly you suddenly realize that you've got to deal with words that span the boundaries because neither of those nodes would ever find that because they've got a subset. You find new problems coming out because you're dealing with the data differently. Right. A way, not the only way to deal with this, for instance, is that you go the other extreme and you do lots of searches for possible hits and you turn the problem into uh, away from a grid like that into a bunch of tiles that may be contiguous and then you do some reducing, map reduce type things. New way of solving the problem, new way of using your brain, thinking about how you manipulate the data. And then it gets even more scary. This is where your brain starts to start to dribble out because what's at the back of these nodes? Well, CPUs, obviously. Um, well, actually, there might be some GPUs. Who's got a laptop with a GPU in? Okay. Who's ever written GPU code? Okay. Well, look at that. Wow, well done. Okay. Um, you can explain to the others afterwards. So what else do we have? Um, FPGAs and ASIC. FPGA, programmable hardware. ASIC, hardware designed to solve the problem. So wired to solve the problem. These are what's coming in the back. And one of our challenges is to figure out how we can get that exposed to the JVM because this is what's coming and this is in the cloud already. GPUs in the cloud, you can buy them already. If you can get the GPU bit right, and there's a whole bunch of heuristics about doing this, it's not simple, but if you can do that, then the performance that you get from using GPUs is orders of magnitude faster, right? Uh, so I'm just showing you some Java API. So I, our J9, OpenJ9 VM has some built-in GPU support. If you use int streams, for instance, in the right way, you just and you've got a GPU, it'll just magically connect up, right? So we've already started doing that, and there are you know things out other things we want to do. But I should point out that GPUs don't work like CPUs. So if you think, oh, I can just have my code and it'll run on a GPU, it's like, no, not really. You have to think differently. This is uh, an, ex ex an ex example to try and explain to you what happens. Um, on a standard CPU, you have a thing called a program counter. And that keeps track of which of the final machine instructions you're executing on. And every thread gets its own program counter, so they can all be different, right? So that means that if you have a choice between two parts of an if statement, they don't cost you anything e e uh, different. Thread one can go down one set of conditions, thread two can go down the other. doesn't cost you anything. On a GPU, that's not true. On a GPU, there's only one program counter. Every single one of these thousands and thousands of CPUs are all in lockstep. And at any point where they have to make a decision about a branch, the ones that are going to go one way are going to get put on hold until all the others have completed. And then the GPU, the program counter, will come back to all the ones that halted and run those, and so on and so on. So basically, if you have lots of if statements, conditional branching in, a, in your code, then your GPU takes the time it takes to traverse all of those. They should be data driven, right? Here's another example. Um, what about when you don't know what words you're searching for? Uh, okay, but that's possible. What happens if I give you a grid and I say, find all the English words, please, or the Polish words, or the German words? How would you go about doing that? Well, nowadays, you might use a neural net. And what you can do with neural nets, and here's some Java APIs that you can go play with, you can teach a neural net the structure of a, pro of an, of a language. Right? And not only can you teach it the structure, if you use it right, and you can go to deep learning for J, has some great examples, you can get it to regurgitate. 
So there are some examples that will spit out Shakespeare-like programming languages. Give it enough data, it can work it out. So you can actually construct a neural network, and there's your killer, you've got to learn how to do this, to do that. You can apply new technologies to solve problems differently if you go learn these things. And at the back end of all this, we're introducing new hardware. Neural networks on a chip. In fact, some of these neural network cards are designed to mimic the human brain. They're laid out like that. They are completely different. They're event-driven. They don't have program counters. They are, you know, not quite human brain on chip, but the, I in that spirit, right? They're event-driven. The way that you give them data is different. Uh, and then, finally, quantum computing. So this is great. This is another search type thing, and I will give you a quantum computer idea of how to do word search, but it's a bit, it's a bit strange, so hang on. There was this guy called um, um, Mr. Glover who showed that he, uh, he, can he could figure out how to reduce a search algorithm, the cost. So normally when you're doing searches, the cost of the search is basically proportional to the number of elements that you've got in the search, in the, in the, in the word grid, for instance. But this guy said, well, I actually, I've got an algorithm that with the right sort of computing, I could uh, search much faster, i.e. the blue line. So think what you could do if you could get your searches from being that sort of scale to that sort of thing. Thing is, of course, you need a cat. You always need a cat. And uh, you need these things called qubits. So uh, again, anybody had a go with a quantum computer? Oh, guess I like this. There's some hands going up. That's excellent. Good. You can explain to the rest of us how it works. Uh, so qubits are weird. That's the best way I can put it. So a qubit is a bit in a quantum computer that can contain all possible states between naught and one. And it's even more complicated than that because they're not like uh, they're not a two-dimensional state, they're a three-dimensional state, if you can imagine such, because they have rotational act, um, elements as well. But qubits um, can contain the state between 0 and 1, and you can entangle them. So you can apply rules to them. So you can say, if this thing is this value or type of this value, then I want this thing to be um, some opposite value or the same value. And because you can entangle these things, uh, as you can see, you can get answers much quicker. So the problem is that quantum computing is in its infancy. You can get, uh, you can go play with one online, you can get about 16 qubits. What we need to fulfill the NSA's desire to be able to break all our encryption is billions of qubits. The best way to think of this is quantum computing is at the stage that computers were in the 1940s. And they're like that weight-wise. This is a lovely picture of a quantum computer. The, the majority of this, in fact, so much of this is to do with getting the actual quantum computing chip down to just above freezing, uh, just above zero Kelvin. Um, and it weighs about the same as a very old 1940s computer, you know, measured in tons. Uh, it has the wonderful characteristic that if it gets warm, your results change. So they have to keep it really cold. So how does it work? Well, I'm still figuring that one out. But I can give you some examples of how you can think about this. So this is, this is where it starts to get. This is sort of the extreme of how you'll be thinking differently. Possibly, you'll still be working when this comes around but it's good to think about. So the green circles are qubits. And you can put a qubit into this positional st high positional st um, situation. You can say, da -da, it, you can be any value. It gets a random value. In fact, it's all possible values. right? Um, and so there's the green circles. And then you can join these things together. So you could, for instance, and this is just made up. It's not meant to be a word search. It's just to give you some examples. You can... Um, join them together. 
right? You can entwine them. So you can say things like A is whatever is, over, is whatever the opposite of B is. Right? There's no answer. You've just put a constraint on the system. And you can say, oh, for instance, that B is the opposite of C. Right? Or and there are ways of doing basic logic. You can say if this one I'm entangled with is a low value, then I'm going to be a high value, otherwise I'm whatever it is. There's a whole bunch of um, uh, what you call them um, units that you can apply, right? And, th and though it's graphical, there is a programming language behind this, a very high-level machine language. And then, and this is where the magic happens, you can have these things called oracles. Oracles can tell you the answer to things, right? That uh, just by going is this the answer? Right. So let me explain. What's going to happen, what would happen is you would construct a quantum computer uh, program with a whole bunch of conditions on a bunch of qubits. And at some point, those qubits would be presented to another program that's, written, that's, it, that's running in quantum state as well. So it can explore all possibilities. And it's going to push out on this last qubit a yes or a no ish based on the inputs and the thing is when we measure when we measure we get a discrete answer but imagine what happens is any one, what you get is a whole bunch of random numbers and some constraints are applied and then a magic thing happens which says this is the right answer and you get a yes or a no right or ish and then the answer comes out but you don't know whether you're going to get a yes or a no because if you imagine those ABC as being three bits in a byte, and that represents some index, you don't know which index is going to come through when you ask. You're just going to do a, a, a random thing. So when you run it, you might just get some, and you said, what numbers have I got? You get numbers, right? But you don't get yes or no, you get some rough number. And then what you do, and I'm not showing it on here because it's far too complicated, is that you can take these numbers and you can uh, you can adjust the error. You can identify by rotating these qubits. You can take the positive, the the uh, uh, the difference between these. So you can say um, the error, basically the error that's in the system, and you can reapply the error system and and highlight the answers. So you can ask it again, and you can get a different answer, right? But you never get yes or no. You get something. And you will apply statistically. Right? You'll do this over and over again. And you'll ask it the same, the same question. And you'll get an answer. And statistically, eventually, you'll get, OK, I know what the answer is. Right? And if there's anything that we could say about the future, is that it's going to be less precise than anything we've dealt with them before. So it's all going to be about stats. Now, if you want to go play with quantum computing, you can do. There's a real one online. Um, you can go to this URL, you can sign up, and you can write really simple quantum computing programs in a graphical form, which is up there, or you can write it in, in Assembler, and you can be submit it, and you'll get an answer. And you will get really simple. And there's some, you can play battleships. There's actually a battleships game for quantum computers, um, but it doesn't sort of tell you whether you sunk your battleship. It says 200% chance of a hit, or minus 10% chance of a hit. And you have to work on percentages, right? The thing is, quantum computing isn't quite here. I like isn't here by long chalk, right? Um, but when it comes, not only is it going to help, it, not only is it going to break things that we're used to, it's also going to give us new opportunities because of that infinite capacity to model things in parallel, right? But you're not designing programs the way you've written before. You're doing. Uh, you're putting constraints, you're thinking about data differently, right? And you're going down the statistical route. Right, so bring this to a close. I hope you see that it was a whirlwind tour. There's lots of hardware coming, there's lots of new requirements on our industry to solve new sorts of problems, make them go fast, do them differently. How do we get neural networks faster? How do we get things like quantum computing into the mix? We don't want to be in a position where we're reinventing 
whole bunch of new technology because that fragments everything. And to be honest, we have the JVM. The JVM design, though it was originally meant to go on toasters, you know, small devices, it's turned out to be something that is so powerful because of all the things that we can do that we're already doing for you. We can take your Java code and we can move it. We can put it on a GPU. Now, the Java that we finally end up with that does these things, it may not be the one that you've got today, but it will be close. It may not be Java, it may be Kotlin, it may be something else. But the VM underneath all this allows us to make use of all the new capabilities Right. And why would we not want to do that? Why would we want to not, um, why would we want to go off and write new things when we can have the best of the breed, all the investment we've got, and, um, and deliver on this stuff? So wherever you go, whether you take your starting the top right and you're writing procedural code, you're going to these other routes. You're going to be doing big data, you're going to be doing quantum computing, maybe your kids are, you're definitely going to be doing neural networks, you're going to be dealing with APIs. You're going to be thinking about things differently. And all the way through this, much as, as, as I said at the beginning, this, the technology is not coming. We're not doing these things because we can. We're doing them because they needed to be done. Right? And the hardware that's being created, thank you, the hardware that's being created is in support of that. But the biggest challenge for everybody is that you've got to think differently. And that's it. Thank you very much.